Good morning. Uh, I think I've met most of you guys. Um, my name is Ishan Swarup. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons here. I started on faculty here about a year ago, working mainly out of Children's Hospital in Oakland. Uh, but I do come over to Mission Bay sometimes as well to do some cases. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. You know, I think we had a great discussion this morning um, in Journal Club. And um, I kind of refrain from saying anything about the Jack Flynn article just because uh, Jack Flynn's a huge mentor of mine. And I would say the one thing to take away from that paper is that not all rules apply to everybody. And so uh, if you look at figure two, which is kind of his seven steps, I do think that's really helpful. And he uses that a lot in terms of the talks he gives. And I oftentimes look at those seven steps and think of what's applicable to my life, especially in the stage of your career that you're in. Um, and, you know, and the other thing to realize is that, you know, he obviously we stand on the shoulder of giants, right? So I think it's a little bit of uh, a, a piecemeal process where things get better with each generation of surgeons that train and each generation of attendings. And so it's a process. And I think um, he's definitely helping to push the process along. And we can all think of ways that we can make that better for, for ourselves and for the future, uh, for the people that follow us. So just a little bit of food for thought. Um, and then also I recognize this is a historic morning since uh, there is going to be new leadership in the White House and our vice president was just sworn in. So uh, try to be brief. And if you guys tune out to listen to that, I'm, I'm totally okay with that too. So um, I totally get it. It's been a long four years for all of us. So um, our task this morning is to talk about Skiffy. Are you guys able to see my screen okay? Perfect. Um, so let's see here. Oops. So the next 30-ish minutes, we'll kind of go over some basics of Skiffy, talk about definitions, epidemiology, um, etiology and risk factors in terms of what we know so far about Skiffy and what uh, we still need to know about Skiffy. We'll talk about basic classification, kind of the traditional ways we think about and talk about Skiffy, but also some um, more kind of research-based uh, classifications that we use, which are helpful when you're reading studies. Um, for, since this is more of a clinical talk, we will talk more about presentation and imaging. What are things that you know, we should be evaluating for in the ER, um, in the operating room, and then treatment um, all the way from kind of more basic things, uh, but also a bit more advanced techniques in Skiffy and more emerging techniques that we um, are starting to consider in patients that, that have a slip capital for amylopipsis. And then we'll end with a smattering of a couple of cases um, that I have from uh, practice, and then also a couple of OIT questions. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, I really don't mind if you if you want to ask questions as we go. So what exactly is Skiffy? Well, it's technically defined as a displacement of the femoral neck or the metaphysis relative to the epiphysis. So the key thing to know here is that the epiphysis really maintains a normal relationship with the acetabulum. Um, and it's really the metaphysis that displaces. Uh, we think that it's due to a weakness of the perichondral ring and slippage through the hypertrophic zone of the physis. So if you think about you know, the four zones that we think about in the physis, this is a, an injury that happens in the hypertrophic zone. Um, and again, the epiphysis remain, maintains a normal relationship and the metaphysis is what displaces. Typically, um, when the metaphysis displaces, you have a, it's basically a three-dimensional deformity. Generally, you see varus in the coronal plane. So if you look at that x-ray, right, there's varus on the coronal plane. Um, there's typically extension in the sagittal plane, so the metaphysis comes anterior to the um, epiphysis, and there's external rotation in the axial plane. So again, that's why you see more of the lesser trochanter on this x-ray, um, because there's external rotation of that metaphyseal component. In some cases, the metaphysis can displace posteriorly or even medially, um, and this creates what we call a valgus skiffy. Uh, valgus skiffies are quite rare, uh, but they are important to think of, especially if you, have a if you have a patient that you're seeing in the ER that has the classic symptoms of a skiffy, but the x-ray doesn't quite look like a regular skiffy. Um, it's always important to think about a valgus skiffy as well, and oftentimes it's helpful to compare the contralateral hip um, and uh, in, in assessing the um, head neck alignment. So epidemiology. Um, it is a, you know, it is a disorder that happens during your growth spurt. So um, it's most common, it's the most common disorder seen in adolescent uh, patients. Um, generally, the age group is nine to 16. So again, the age that, you know, the, the age range that patients are growing the fastest. Um, the incidence is generally about 10 cases per 100,000 children. Um, and the incidence is supposed, is thought to be a little bit higher in males compared to females. Um, there is some 
um, propensity or some predilection towards some ethnic groups, including African Americans and Pacific Islanders. We don't quite understand why that is. It's probably some genetic component, um, maybe something related to the biology of the physis itself. Um, but there, those are considered to be somewhat um, some risk factors uh, for Skiffy. And then there is some seasonal variation as well. Um, we don't see that as much in a place like California, even though I think we do. We tend to see it more oftentimes in the in the fall months, but. Um, there have been some studies that have shown that in latitudes north of 40 degrees, so that's like New York City roughly, um, it does occur more frequently in the summer and fall. Again, not sure why that is, um, but that is something that's been noticed as well. That there may be some seasonal variation in, in the presentation of Skiffy. Um, oftentimes, Skiffy can be bilateral, especially in younger children. And the rates of bilateral Skiffy are kind of all over the place in the literature. Um, but generally, some people say that at, at the time of presentation, some half of patients may have bilateral symptoms. That may be a little bit of an overestimate, but it's always the important thing to take away is always um, critically evaluate the contralateral hip when you're evaluating a patient for Skiffy um, in clinic or in the emergency room. So let's dive a little bit deeper um, into etiology and risk factors. So um, the etiology of it is, is really multifactorial, right? So in many things in orthopedics, you kind of have to you know, even though we are a very technical specialty um, in pediatrics, you oftentimes have to think of a lot of different things. So there's mechanical forces, right? So having the, um, if, if you have a varus neck shaft angle, for example, you have increased forces across the physis. So that's an important consideration. Endocrine factors, right? So classically things like hypothyroidism, chronic renal failure, um, these all things predispose you to Skiffy. And that probably has to do somewhat with the biology at the physis level. And then there's genetic factors, right? And this, again, uh, unclear exactly how that plays in, but probably related to the, the physeal anatomy. And so the way to think, in, in a nutshell, the way to think of you know, the etiology, it's really mechanical forces acting on a susceptible physis. And I think if you kind of just kind of have that statement in your mind, you'll kind of understand, and it'll be easier for you to explain this to patients as, as to why is this happening to me. Um, endocrine disorders, we kind of talked about this, but um, hypothyroidism, chronic renal failure, um, hyperparathyroid, um, disorders that require growth hormone. I think it's always important to ask these questions when you see patients. Um, but I think the, in, in, if you're seeing a, a very typical presentation of a 12 or a 13 year old with a Skiffy, unlo relatively unlikely, but it can happen. Um, but the population where you really should be um, thinking about this strongly is the really young patient, right? So if you have like a seven year old who presents with a Skiffy, which is atypical, um, um, or bilateral Skiffies in a really young kid, those are things where you really want to consider um, these thyroid or these endocrine disorders and potentially even send labs um, from the emergency room um, to consider these, um, these abnormalities. Other risk factors, obesity. Um, and this maybe kind of, kind of goes back to the whole mechanical uh, risk factors, right? The, the greater body weight you have, the more force is transmitted uh, through your weight bearing axis. Um, a vertically oriented physis. This goes back to the principle of um, the load being seen by the femoral neck or the epiphysis, um, kind of similar to what you think of in a femoral neck fracture, right? That's the reason why we do valgus osteotomies for femoral neck fracture, similar type of thought process. Um, previous radiation therapy, then again, this kind of weakens the uh, physis and makes it more susceptible. Um, so th those are all other risk factors that we sometimes think about for patients with Skiffy. So I think this is probably one of the most important slides I'm going to share with you guys today. Um, and this is really how do we um, describe Skiffy and how do we communicate um, with each other and uh, with colleagues. And so classically, and probably the most important classification no is the one that, bases, that is based on stability, right? So a stable Skiffy, this was first described by uh, Loader. Um, and so basically a stable Skiffy is a Skiffy in which you're able to bear weight with or without crutches. And an unstable Skiffy is a Skiffy in which you are unable to bear weight, either with or without crutches. And so why is this an important classification? Well, it's important because one, it's simple, right? So it's very easy to kind of communicate uh, what the patient, who, what, what kind of a Skiffy the patient has in the emergency room. And the other is this does have some prognostic value. So in the original papers by Loader, a stable Skiffy had a very low risk of osteonecrosis. In fact, it was kind of less than 10%, um, even kind of I think it was in the low, low single digits for, for the rate of osteonecrosis. Whereas the unstable Skiffies had a risk of osteonecrosis of about 47%, which is pretty high. And so from a prognosis factor uh, or prognostic factor, that was really important. Subsequent studies since this time have actually shown that the rate with unstable Skiffy might, is probably a little bit lower. The rate of osteonecrosis is probably more around you know, the mid-20s. 
but still it's significantly higher than a patient with a stable Skippy. So I think that that's the important thing to know about that classification. The other classification that we sometimes talk about is the temporal classification. So this is kind of, is it acute, is it chronic, or is it acute on chronic? And so in general, acute Skippies are Skippies that present with symptoms lasting less than or equal to about three weeks. Um, chronic Skippies, which are the most common type of presentation, they're usually longer than three weeks. And then acute on chronic is kind of like, you know, had some symptoms at baseline, but then had an acute exacerbation of symptoms. And so that, that's what the term that we use um, in those cases. There's no real prognostic implication to these, but it does give you an idea, you know, how long has this patient been dealing with it? Um, obviously acute skiffies, you can think of unstable skiffies are probably most commonly acute or acute on chronic because they, there's an acute onset of symptoms. Um, unstable skiffies generally are chronic, but um, again, no, um, uh, hard to make very broad generalizations about, you know, correlation between the two. And then the third classification to know about is radiographic severity. And so this has a little bit more implications to surgical planning and um, maybe even prognosis after in terms of symptoms. And so the way we think about this is mild, moderate, and severe. Um, this is based off of the Southwick angle, which we'll talk about in a, in a few slides. Um, and this again, gives you an idea of how bad is the deformity. Um, and like, we, like I just mentioned, this has implications to treatment, not necessarily to, to um, any prognosis, um, any prognosis acutely. The one thing I forgot to mention is that the term pre-slip will come up too, and you'll you'll see that you know we oftentimes use that word in clinic. Um, and the the way we think about pre-slip, or the way I think about pre-slip, is you know um, there's some kind of um, insidious pain that's really hard to describe. There may be some um, you know antalgic gait or occasional limping. Um, there may be exertional pain uh, that may be happening. You know, Kit says that with activity, they have pain in the hip. Um, there might be some de subtle decrease in internal rotation on exam. X-rays look normal, but then if you get an MRI, you see this periphyseal edema. Um, that is a, a pre-slip or a slip that's about to happen. Again, this doesn't have a, a clear um, definition per se, but it's more kind of the, if you think of this, the, the time, you know, the timeline, this is right before something develops into a stable or an unstable Skiffy. So what do we do when we see a kid who presents with a Skiffy? So generally the story is, you know, I've been having pain in the hip or in the groin area, maybe some pain in the knee area for a couple of weeks. Um, the first thing to always do is evaluate gait and right. And so that's kind of for two purposes. One is to see which hip is affected and how severely is it affected. And the other is to assess if they're weight bearing or not, because that's your classification. Um, ob obviously habitus can play a role in, in your observation as well. You're trying to think again, think about the mechanical factors that are playing on a susceptible physis. In terms of the history, the important things to take away from the history are the, the time frame of how long this has been going on and the level of symptoms, um, which is also important. Um, be, always beware of kind of the adolescent uh, with isolated knee pain. Um, oftentimes these are the kids that present to their pediatrician with knee pain. There's knee x-rays that are done, which look normal. And sure enough, this is a patient that has Skiffy. And, and the reason why, you know, maybe for more of the junior residents is there is a referred pain pattern that you have. And so it's related to the, the activation of the medial obturator nerve. And so patients perceive the pain as, be, as coming from the knee but it's actually emanating from the hip. On physical exam, the important things to assess, um, of course, gait is part of your physical exam, but um, generally patients have limited flexion um, as well as obligate external rotation. Um, and that really is because you have metaphyseal impingement on the acetabular rim. So again, if you think back to the deformity that you have where it's a metaphyseal deformity with extension and external rotation as you flex up the hip, um, sure enough, you get impingement of that uh, metaphyseal uh, fragment on the acetabular rim. And so you have, as a result, you externally rotate your hip as you flex it up. Sorry to interrupt Dr. Soria, but really yeah. quick question about that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, with a suspected Skiffy, um, you know, you don't wanna do too much of an exam because you worry about displacing it. So how much do you recommend that residents do when you're evaluating someone that you think may have Skiffy? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think generally for a stable slip, it's okay to, to do a regular exam uh, because generally, you know, that's uh, if so stay, going back to if you if the kid can walk with crutches or without crutches, I think it's reasonable to do a, um, a physical exam in which you try to flex the hip, um, assess for obligate external rotation. Um, however, if it's an unstable slip where, you know, there's uh, been an acute onset of symptoms, 
And obviously in today's day and age, you've oftentimes seen the x-ray before you walk into the room. And clearly if it's looking like a displaced unstable Skippy, then that's one where it is okay to maybe defer, defer your physical exam um, because um, you obviously don't want to cause any other you know, damage to the retinacular vessels, which probably is a reason why there's a higher rate of osteonecrosis and unstable Skippy. We'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about treatment. And so for an unstable Skippy, I think it's fair to do more, a more limited assessment, you know, obviously a neurovascular exam, log roll, things like that, ruling out any other concomitant things, looking at the other hip, you know, you can obviously examine the other hip. Um, but for a stable Skippy, I would say it's, it's fair, to, fair to do a, a more thorough assessment. Unstable Skippies maybe do a more abbreviated assessment. Good question, though. All right, so um, imaging, um, oftentimes you've already gotten the imaging or, or the ER has already gotten it for you by the time you go down, but you know, what are you looking at on the x-ray? And so um, first of all, it's important to get an AP and a frog leg lateral, um, if you can, of the, of, the, of the hip. Sometimes the frog is, is harder to do, especially in an unstable setting. Um, uh, but you know, um, in the majority of cases, because the majority of cases are stable and chronic, um, you should be able to get um, some reasonable imaging so in the AP, the things to look at are um, Klein's line, right? So that's a line that's kind of drawn um, adjacent to the metaphysis or, um, of the uh, proximal femur. And that line should transect um, the epiphysis at some point. Um, and that basically shows you that the epiphysis has a normal relationship or somewhat of a normal relationship with the metaphysis. However, if it doesn't transect the epiphysis, then that suggests that the uh, metaphyseal epiphyseal relationship is off, right? Um, and again, it's consistent with the Skiffy. And this can be subtle, um, but it's important to kind of look at this. And again, um, oftentimes you have the contralateral hip as a control. However, if both hips are involved, then you may have this be abnormal on both sides. Um, and so the the key is look at this on both hips um, uh, when you're when you're assessing it. What else do I look at? I look at um, the physis itself. The physis, you know, is um, Almost, I, I think of the phys a little bit like you know a fracture pattern or a fracture line, right? It kind of tells a little bit of a story, um, just like you know a transverse fracture mechanism is very different from a spiral oblique. A, a physis also can tell you something. So if you're seeing some physial blurring or irregularity, then um, th my antenna goes up a little bit more. Like, is this something that is an ab you know abnormality at the physial level? Um, so that's another thing to look at. There is this thing that you'll read in the literature, which is called the um, metaphyseal branch sign of steel. Essentially what that is, is that it's increased density over the metaphysis um, of the femoral neck adjacent to the physis. And again, this happens because of the deformity you see in Skiffy. So as the metaphysis comes anterior and externally rotates, the projection of it right around the physis and the metaphyseal component looks a little bit darker. Um, and so um, that's why you see that increased density. And that's another uh, important sign to look at. Um, on the frog lateral, what you're looking at is posterior displacement. And that's where you're doing a lot of your measurements, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but that can be helpful as well, um, is to look at on the frog lateral. And the frog lateral is really where you can sometimes even pick up some subtle slips, um, especially when you compare one side to the other. And you'll say that, huh, it's interesting that the metaphysis is a bit more anterior to the epiphysis on one side versus the other. Um, advanced imaging is something that is a bit, a bit more of an evolving science for Skippy. And I would say that it's still um, hard to, you know, there, there's no general guidelines on who should be getting advanced imaging um, at the time of diagnosis. The patients that I usually get an MRI for are patients that have a classic history for a Skippy, but the x-rays are not super convincing. Um, and I sometimes even get it for the valgus slips um, if I'm concerned about a valgus slip. So basically to me is if the history and the um, exam and the plain radiographs are not all kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of consistent with each other, then I'll get an MRI. Um, and the reason for the MRI is again, you'll see periphyseal edema which will suggest that there is a, either a pre-slip or there is a true Skippy in a valgus Skippy case, but it just gives you more confidence um, that this is a, you know, a slip capital femoral epiphysis versus something else that could be affecting the hip. So imaging, what, what angles are we measuring? So um, classically the angles that every Skippy should get measured is a Southwick slip angle. Um, this, is, this has been classically defined on the frog lateral x-ray. I know here it's shown on the AP, but it's really on the frog lateral. And instead of remembering the eponym, I think it's actually helpful to remember the technical name of it because it just reminds you how to measure it. So it's really the epiphyseal diaphyseal angle. So if you just remember it's the epiphyseal diaphyseal angle, you always remember how to draw it. Um, and so, um, and then the other thing to know is that 
the angle itself is not just the angle of that one particular hip, it's the difference between one hip and the other. Um, and so um, that's another important thing to, to remember. And this is this kind of is uh, related to um, your severity. So mild slips are generally angles that are less than 30 degrees, moderate or 30 to 50, and severe or greater than 50. Another simplistic way to think about, um, or another simplistic angle or something to know is just the grading. And this, you know, we don't necessarily use this as much, or at least I don't um, when I'm communicating, but I do use this when I'm doing my surgical planning. So for those of you who have pinned a, um, who have done some inside you screw fixation for a skippy, I actually draw my incision um, more lateral if it's a low grade skippy and more anterior if it's a higher grade skippy. And so this is to me is, is kind of based on um, the frog lateral x-ray and essentially it's me just roughly knowing how much of the, uh, how displaces is the metapsis relative to the epiphysis? Is it about a third off? Is it more than a third, um, about a half, or is it more than a half? And so that just kind of helps me in my mind when I'm doing my surgical incision, I don't localize with x-ray, I just draw it and so I kind of base it off of the degree of the slip um, on the, on the x-ray. There are some other fancy measurements um, that you can do. Um, there is a thing called a posterior sloping angle. Um, and I think this is probably gonna be more relevant for the interns and PGY2s. There's gonna be more literature coming out on this. And so it is something that we may start measuring, start measuring more routinely. Um, I'll touch upon that a little bit uh, when we talk about risk for subsequent contralateral skippy. Um, but just know that there are some other angles, um, which really the gist of it is looking at the relationship of the epiphysis relative to the metaphysis. There's just different ways to quantify that um, um, and uh, be able to tell what's the risk of the other side slipping if, if it's abnormal, if it's a subtle slip. Um, so treatment. Um, well, in general, for stable skippies, treatment across America, across North America, across the world is in situ fixation. And so generally it's a single cannulated screw. Um, you can use anywhere from a 6.5 um, or a 7.3, which is standard in, in, in our synthy sets, or a couple of the more pediatric sets like orthopediatrics has a 7.0 cannulated screw as well. Um, and um, you can use any of those sizes um, for this. Um, the goal of, or the kind of the, um, principles of fixation are you want to get your screw in the center center position. And so try to get it through the center um, of the um, physis into the center of the epiphysis. And the stability of your construct or the stability of your screw um, or fixation really um, hinges on the fact that you need to, you want to have at least four threads in the epiphysis. Um, and so that's uh, another uh, important principle to know. Um, generally, kind of technically, how do we do this? Um, People do it a little bit differently. Um, I do this on a flat top Jackson table um, with the leg, just kind of uh, with the patient supine. Um, I do, I localize um, on the AP just to kind of have a rough idea of the trajectory of my screw. So I draw, I draw a line along the, uh, the trajectory of my proposed screw. And then I make my incision as a um, oblique incision kind of along that line. Um, and I find that that gives me a little bit of more flexibility in terms of going medial lateral, um, proximal and distal. And then um, in terms of where along that line do you make your incision, again, it's based on the, the degree of slip. So if it's a low grade slip, I'll be pretty far out lateral. Um, and if it's a more high grade slip, I'll be more anterior. Um, one thing to be aware of is your screw insertion. Generally, I try to be lateral to the intertrochanteric line. And that's based off of a study that was done in San Diego, which showed that if you put a screw medial to the intertrochanteric line, then uh, patients are at a higher risk of impingement due to the screw, which makes sense, right? Because if this, if you, it's basically an anterior bump on the femoral neck. And so I try my best to, to either keep it at the intertrochanteric line or a little bit lateral to the line. Um, it's a standard cannulated screw technique. So you put your guide wire up, you measure, you drill, put up this, you know, put the screw. Um, I am using fully threaded screws generally for this, even though I know this x-ray shows partially threaded screws. Um, I do find that it's a little bit easier to take out if you have to take it out because you have more threads, um, and less screw for the, less um, chance for the screw to break. Um, and then how do you assess if the screw has penetrated the head or not? There's a couple of ways to do it. Um, so the way that, um, that I do it is I call it the approach with raw technique. I think you guys have probably seen this for femoral neck fractures um, in adults, basically take a hip through a range of motion. 
and you know, as you internally and externally rotate the, the head uh, or the hip, you see that the screw tip get closer and closer and closer to the subchondral bone, but you just wanna make sure that it never penetrates the chondral bone. Another way to do it, um, I think Dr. Diab does it this way, is he actually puts a little bit of dye in through the cannulated um, screw hole. Um, and if you see any extravasation of dye in the joint, that could be another sign. Um, so there's a couple of ways to do it, but it's, it's obviously important to have a technique uh, to assess that because you don't want to have an inadvertent screw penetration because that can lead to chondrolysis and uh, joint degeneration. One of the questions that does come up is what happens if the, if the guide pin transiently penetrate, uh, penetrates the femoral head? It happens to everybody. Um, and actually there was a study that was done that did show that just transient penetration of the femoral um, head by a pin is not associated with chondrolysis. So even though obviously we try to avoid it, um, you always have to be cognizant of your pin position as you're drilling. Um, these are threaded pins, so they can migrate as you drill. And so it's always important to kind of keep that in mind from a technical point of view when you're doing that, when you're doing a, a, an inside chief fixation. Um, the other way I kind of mentioned, so I do on flat tap Jackson, Jackson, the other way to do it is on a fracture table. Um, and actually in residency, that's how we used to do it. Um, and it's also pretty, uh, easy and some easy to do. It is a little bit easier. Maybe you don't have to move the hip around as you do an AP and lateral X-ray, um, but um, either way is is is, a, is acceptable. So, what about for the unstable cases? So, this is a bit more controversial, right? So, if you go back to our initial discussion, unstable skippies generally have a high risk of osteonecrosis, and so anything we can do to decrease that risk is helpful. And so. Generally, the conventional treatment was minimal reduction and inside chief fixation um, within 24 hours. And in fact, just doing that by itself did decrease the AVN risk. Um, and some studies reported that the risk came down to kind of the low to mid teens um, after just a minimal reduction. Um, more recently, um, a lot of us have gotten more interested in developing ways that we can safely reduce a skiffy. And so there's been a renewed interest in this idea of a closed reduction. Um, followed by fixation. And so um, there's a thing called a lead better technique, which has been described for femoral neck fractures. And people use the same term, but it's a, it's a similar technique that you can do to reduce um, an unstable skiffy. Um, it's kind of comprised of abduction, flexion, internal rotation, and extension. Um, and which in my anecdotal experience as a fellow and as an attending, it, it is quite successful in, in improving the alignment but obviously you worry a little bit about trauma to the metaphysis. That's why this is something that you would do in the, in the OR. And, and to Heather's point, this is the reason why for unstable skippies, it's probably better to just do that in the operating room and get a good, you know, in terms of the deferring the exam in the ER. Um, and so there is uh, increasing body of literature. They have, there hasn't been a good study that's come out looking at the risk of AVN um, after this closed reduction technique, but I do think it's gonna be coming out in the near future because more and more of us are doing it um, and are getting reasonable results with it. There are some other techniques. There's a um, uh, Klaus Parsch uh, out of Europe uh, described kind of a, um, a finger reduction type of technique. So he basically did an anterolateral approach. So basically a, a kind of a Watson Jones type of an approach, um, open reduction through that um, with hip manipulation and using your finger to kind of reduce that metaphyseal fragment back and then inside to fixation. Um, he actually reported a, a, an osteonecrosis rate of 4.9%, or sorry, four, I think it was like, yeah, it was around, it was in the high 4% range, but much lower than any of the other studies that have been shown. Now, um, very few of us have been, have adapt, you know, adopted this primarily because it hasn't really caught on. Uh, but I do think there's, again, with more renewed interest in how do we decrease deformity? How do we decrease the risk of osteonecrosis in these unstable skippies? Um, that might be something that, that um, will gain some popularity in the years to come. The modified done is really the, the technique that has taken off. Um, in North America, started out in Switzerland uh, with, with Gons and the group. Um, and then the modified done, essentially what you're doing is you're doing a capital realignment. So it's a surgical hip dislocation. It's a lateral approach to the hip. So a modified Gibson approach uh, for those of you who are kind of interested in, in, in um, hip preservation. Um, through that approach, you essentially um, preserve the retinacular vessels. You basically peel them back as a periosteal sleeve, um, leave them connected to the epiphysis, realign the epiphysis, and then fix um, the skiffy. The largest study on modified done has shown that the rate of osteonecrosis is, um, is lower than just 
um, no treatment. So it comes down from about 47% to more to just about half of that, around 24%, 25%. Um, and the real advantage of it is that you're restoring normal anatomy. So you're de decreasing the risk of impingement, joint degeneration later on. On the flip side, it is a very um, technical procedure. And it's one of those things that the more you do, the better you are at it. So places that don't do as many of these presumably um, may, have, may not have the same type of outcomes as places that do a lot of these. Um, and then the last point, um, especially if you read literature on unstable skippies is, you know, should, should we be doing a capsular decompression? So again, this kind of goes back to the femoral neck um, idea. Um, should you be decreasing that intracapsular tamponade effect, which possibly is related to osteonecrosis? And so oftentimes we do, uh, at least I do for unstable skippies. If, after I've done a closed reduction and fixation, I'll oftentimes just take a cob and slide it through that lateral incision. Um, along the neck and open up the capsule. Um, and oftentimes you see a gush of blood um, that comes out. It probably just makes you feel better more than anything else, but at least um, you know that is something that has been shown. There has been a meta-analysis that has shown though that um, maybe a capsule decompression um, has, no, has no effect on the risk of osteonecrosis. But again, it's really hard to study um, osteonecrosis in the setting of an unstable skiffy because the degree of an unstable skiffy, the amount of damage to the retinacular vessels is all very variable. How you're treating it is variable. And so I think um, this is one where I kind of think of, you know, what makes sense in my mind and common sense than necessarily literature that's, that, or, you know, hard and fast literature that's guiding my decision making. Just um, in the interest of time, I'll skip through a couple of these slides real quick. This is a, um, you know, we just finished writing up this review paper on unstable Skiffy with Alejandro and Sachin. And, and you can see that all of these techniques are, have been described and, and really um, the, one, the, the level of evidence is quite low still because one is we don't have um, that much data on this. Um, and then we also don't have any comparative studies. So comparing a modified done to a closed reduction that has not been done. Um, and so you can see that the level of recommendations are, are quite low. And this is kind of where all these multi, you know, multi-center study groups really come into play because, because all of us are doing it a little bit differently. It, that does help us, you know, if I, if a few of us are doing closed reductions, a few are doing modified dons, hopefully in a couple of years from now, we'll be able to kind of do a, a more rigorous comparison of our approaches and see if we can find a better, a better treatment algorithm for these uh, cases. Uh, prophylactic pinning, this is important to consider, especially in younger patients, uh, patients that have an endocrine abnormality, Patients that have a lower uh, or uh, are younger uh, in terms of their skeletal age. So we oftentimes use the thing called a modified Oxford score. Um, uh, I'll often ask you guys that question if it's a patient, if I'm on call and you guys are seeing a skiffy. Um, kind of the, the poor man's way of assessing that is just looking at the triradic cartilage. Um, so is it open or closed? Um, if it's open, then they're skeletally immature. If it's closed, then they're probably getting to be more skeletally mature. And then um, the posterior sloping angle, that's what we kind of alluded to earlier. Um, of the unaffected hip, that can be helpful as well. Um, the table on top there is a, is a study that we had done about a year or two ago, which again shows that the rate of contralateral slip gets lower the older you get, but it is quite high um, the younger you are. So it's important to consider in younger patients. Um, how do we, can we predict who's gonna get a subsequent slip? And so this is um, a study that, it is a, that I did as a fellow. And the three factors that we really found that were predictive were age, uh, the modified Oxford score and the difference in the epiphyseodaxial angle. And so uh, basically if you were younger than age, uh, if you were 11 or younger at the time of presentation, if you had a modified Oxford score less than or equal to 20, and if your epiphyseodaxial angle, so the difference between the two hips was less than or equal to 21, um, then those factors were highly predictive of developing a contralateral slip. So if I, oftentimes when I'm counseling patients, should we um, in, you know, do insight fixation of the contralateral hip? Um, these are the factors I'm looking at and providing them with some, somewhat of an idea of which, uh, which ones should get a prophylactic um, screw or not. So Skippy long-term, why is this important? Well, generally, um, inside fixa to fixation has good outcomes, um, and um, especially for mild, stable Skippies. However, slip progression can happen. So that's why these kids um, that we see, we, I oftentimes limit them from... Um, uh, high intensity activities until the physis is totally closed uh, because I want to prevent slip progression. Um, osteonecrosis is another important one. We kind of uh, have talked about this um, a lot now, but again, that's an important thing to look at in, in subsequent x-rays when you see these patients for follow-up. Um, and again, more highly associated with unstable Skiffy. This is a, a really nice image. I know some of you guys know uh, Wei um, 
from the St. Mary's program, but he, he kind of did this image for one of our um, papers. And you can kind of see how intimately those retinacular vessels are associated with the femoral neck and gives you an appreciation for, um, for kind of why we, you know, uh, why unstable slips are associated with osteonecrosis and why things like capsular decompression we think about as being an important treatment, uh, part of the treatment. So long-term, what can you get? Well, long-term you can get proximal femoral deformity. So right, this can result in FAI. Um, and how do you treat this? You oftentimes treat this with a surgical hip dislocation uh, plus or minus a proximal femoral osteotomy and an osteoplasty. Um, traditionally, this was treated with just an osteotomy. So there's different types of osteotomies you can do. Um, and so, you know, depending on what part of the femur you're cutting, if you're cutting the intertrochanteric region, it's called an Imhauser, which is probably the most common. A subtrochanteric is called a Southwick. Uh, easy way to remember that is intertrochanteric is I, Imhauser is with an I, and a subtroch is an S, and that's Southwick. Um, in my practice, I would usually do a combined approach where you do a surgical hip dislocation and do an osteoplasty to decrease that bump, um, and then do a proximal femoral osteotomy. I find that that helps you you know, by doing it that way, it decreases the amount of flexion that you need to do at the osteotomy site and also helps to decrease the amount of rotation you have to do. And so I think just from kind of a, um, a fixation point of view, bone healing point of view, it just makes the osteotomy um, a, a bit more, um, uh, I don't know, in my hands, a little bit, a little bit easier to, uh, to, to kind of think about and rationalize um, after you've done a little bit of an osteoplasty in the front. And then obviously joint degeneration is what we're trying to prevent, right? So these are the patients that show up in arthroplasty clinic. They have that pistol grip deformity. Maybe they had a skiffy or a missed skiffy as a kid. Um, and generally the rates of, of total hip arthroplasty um, is like, if you look at patients that are kind of are in the 20 to 30 age group, about 5% of them um, probably had a skiffy. Um, and so the risk of joint degeneration is real because it changes the anatomy. Um, and it's, it is important to counsel families, um, especially for the more severe slips. Um, that you're seeing um, after fixation in clinic. So in the last five minutes or so here, five or six minutes, um, let's just jump through, go through a couple of cases. So, um, you know, feel free to jump in. Anybody can kind of answer. So case one, uh, or if not, I can, I can definitely ask people too. So case one, this is a 13 year old male um, who's presenting with three months of left knee pain. On physical exam, he's able to bear weight, but has an antalgic gait, has pain with internal hip rotation. And so, you know, what's the diagnosis and what's the classification here? So, you can open it up to anybody. Anybody can jump in. So let's talk about diagnosis. So uh, diagnosis classification kind of means the same thing. We know it's a skippy. So tell me maybe, you know, is this uh, stable or unstable? Anybody? Stable. Stable, perfect. Um, acute or chronic? Chronic. Chronic, good. And um, treatment-wise, um, how, how are we gonna fix this? Probably inside to pin fixation or screw fixation. Inside to screw fixation, perfect. And so um, in terms of what would you do, would you send this kid home from the ER and have him come back for outpatient surgery? Would you admit them? Would you do this overnight? Would you do it the next day? I think if it's stable and they can, uh, and they can walk on it. Um, I don't think it needs to be admitted and happen that night, but I do think it's something you want to do sooner rather than later. The other thing that we don't have any information on right now is the contralateral side. Um, so I'd probably also get, you know, views of at least an AP pelvis and, and maybe dedicated views of the, the right hip. As well. Yeah. Yeah. So good points. However, I would say in general for even for stable slips, if they come into the ER, you admit them um, because if we get to it, I'll show you a case. You know, uh, we've all heard of or seen a stable slip turn into an unstable slip, and so um, we obviously just don't want that to happen on our watch. And so, oftentimes, if you have a stable slip that's in the ER, we're admitting that we're admitting it for surgery. Doesn't have to be emergent. Usually, can be done the next day. All right, case two. So, thirteen-year-old, um, another boy. Uh, fell at school, reported acute pain in the left hip, and he's, he arrived to the ER on a gurney. Uh, you try to get him to, to walk, he can't walk. Um, has Clearly, as you start to flex him up a little bit, he's externally rotating as you do it. So again, stable or unstable? Unstable. Unstable. And um, acute or chronic? 
cute. Yeah. And um, what do you see on x-ray that makes you also think that this is a cute? It's a little bit of guess what I'm thinking, but if you look at look back at this x-ray, right, you kind of see that the femoral neck has, the metaphysis has some, has a little bit of a hump, kind of suggests to you like this has been going on for a while. And you look at this and you see the physis is wide on that AP, there's varus, um, there's clearly displacement on that hip dedicated view as well. You can see that metaphysis is anterior. So you're seeing the epiphysis through the metaphysis. And so again, another idea that this is acute. So what do we do for this one? What's our treatment? What are we, are we admitting this? Are we saying, here's the number call clinic? Um, when are we doing it? What's, what, are, what are our thoughts? Admit and, and do it. <laughs> yeah, oh, do it overnight, do it next morning. What do you think? You know, I think it depends on what time it is. If it's two in the morning, I don't think you need to get everyone to the OR, but if it's like seven o'clock, eight o'clock, when all the PEDS consults seem to come in, uh, that seems like could could do that that night. Yeah, I would say it's urgent, but not emergent, right? So I would say that this is something that, again, I probably wouldn't do in the middle of the night because, again, you don't have, you know, you have like the the nursing staff that usually does like pilonidal cysts and stuff. And so they have no idea what, what you're talking about. And then um, uh, it's probably better to also do in daylight hours in case, you know, um, you have more help around, you have a lot more resources available too. So I think it's reasonable to do that. Um, good. And this is one unstable slips I would say are the one that I would definitely warrant a call to the attending to let them know that this has come in. Uh, because again, it has implications for prognosis, right? So osteonecrosis is a real risk, and that's something that the attending um, should have a conversation with the family about. All right, let's go to the next. Oh, uh, what do we not have in this picture that we uh, we should get? A lateral. Frog lateral. Yeah. So this is a frog lateral of the contralateral side, and what do we see on that? Flip there too. This is what? It looks like it's flipped there as well. Yeah, and why do you say that, Heather? Uh, the epiphysis is like posterior to the or the yeah to the um, to the neck. Yeah, you can almost see like a climb line on a lateral, right? It like wouldn't wouldn't quite hit the epiphysis. So you can see that there's a little bit of gapping here, uh, which suggests that there's probably a, a stable slip on the other side that's going on too. So would, would, would counsel this patient to have uh, insight fixation of the other side too. All right, um, is this our last one? Might be the last one. So 11-year-old um, girl comes in with left hip pain for the last three weeks um, after falling during high jump, has been able to walk on it, do okay. Um, these were the x-rays at that point. Um, let's see, uh, Gopal, what do you think? This x-ray. So AP of a uh, skeletally immature um, uh, pelvis. Um, so, you know, obviously we're looking for a skiffy. I'd want to see a, a frog lateral of both to evaluate Klein's line to see if there is a uh, slip. Right. So this was uh, and then obviously open triradial cartilages. Got it. So this was seen like I don't know somewhere up north. Um, they weren't able to get a lateral. This is all they got. Um, anything on the AP that looks concerning? And focus on that left hip because that's the side that this kid had symptoms on. Mm -hmm. um, I just looks a little wide on the left side. Yeah, I, I would say that too. And also Klein's line, right? Like, if, again, I know it's a small image, but if you think of drawing that line along the, meta on the metaphysis, you could convince yourself that not much of that line is being bisected by the epiphysis, or is being not much of the epiphysis is being transected by that line. So maybe this was something going on. So anyway, kid was out at an outside hospital, was diagnosed with a kind of a wastebasket type of you know diagnosis, um, and discharged with follow up. Uh, she was in theater practice, jumping around, and then had immediate and severe pain um, on that hip. Gopal, what do you think happened? So there was a acute slip. 
Yeah, so that turned into this, right? Which is a acute unstable slip. So this is kind of the scenario that we were talking about, about earlier. Um, still had no pain in the right hip at this time. And so um, what would we do for treatment for this? What are, so going back to our talk, what are kind of the options? What are, what, what could you do? The transfer, transfer in, <laughs> um, check the other side carefully with the uh, frog lateral. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, treatment um, would be urgent. Um, and then the options are open versus closed reduction and then uh, uh, in situ fixation. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, option one would be try to get a, a closed reduction based on some of the information you presented um, and, uh, um, and then try to try to pin it. That would be, I think, ideal. And then, you know, again, do a capsular decompression as we discussed. Yeah, perfect. So that's what we did in this case. We did a, um, a closed reduction. So you can see kind of on the images here on the side, this is kind of the reduction maneuver as you abduct the hip, flex it up, um, rotate and extend, you can see that the reduction actually went quite smoothly um, for this. Um, oftentimes these unstable slips, I'm putting two screws in because there is a higher risk of progression. And so for more stability, uh, putting in two screws, the first guide pin you put in is pretty, it's, it's pretty much blind because you can't really get a lateral x-ray because it's an unstable slip. So you're kind of just basing it um, a little bit in, off of, you know, just kind of putting a, a normal anatomy. Um, and you don't, I, I, I'm not super picky about where that pin is going as long as it's getting into the epiphysis and providing some stability. And then you can get a lateral. So you can probably see, I don't remember exactly, but probably in this case, I bet you this pin here was my initial pin. Didn't love it, but it was actually doing something. And then I put a different um, screw in above there. Um, one of the things we, you can also do is you see this little catheter here. This is, an, it, this is a perfusion monitor. So sometimes what you can do is, you know, this maybe gets a little bit more into the advanced thought process of, of a closed reduction versus maybe doing a open reduction and capital realignment. But oftentimes what we'll do is um, you can actually put a little um, ICP probe up your cannulated screw and look at the perfusion of the femoral head. And it should mimic, um, you know, regular arterial flow, which again is reassuring, which tells you that the epiphysis has blood flow. And so you can feel a little bit more rest assured that maybe um, you know, um, uh, this kid is going to do fine. And then a capsular decompression, um, like you mentioned. Um, and then I know Dr. Sabatini is probably going to be starting soon, but just a, a last case here. This is, uh, I'll just go over this um, in the interest of time. So 16 year old with a six month history um, of right groin pain, three years status post in site two fixation. And so this, you, you know, the, you can see on the x-ray there that um, there's decreased head neck offset, right? So that's what happens when you have a, a skiffy deformity is that you develop this cam lesion. Um, and then they have FAI. A lot, a lot of times if it's an active kid, it can be um, uh, functionally quite, a, quite debilitating. And so um, the treatment that we did for this was a surgical hip dislocation um, and osteoplasty. So you kind of create that head neck offset um, through that approach and then do your... Um, femoral osteotomy. So in this case, uh, some flexion and internal rotation to regain some of the motion that, that you, that the kid has lost um, and to provide some more function for the hip. So in conclusion, so Skiffy um, is the most common hip disorder in adolescence. It's important to know. Um, risk factors include endocrine abnormality and obesity. Classification is based on stability, timing, and radiographs. Um, stable skiffies are generally managed with incisive fixation, whereas unstable skiffies are generally managed with some type of realignment and fixation. Prophylactic pinning should be considered, especially in younger patients, patients with endocrine abnormalities and radiographic risk factors. And then um, late sequela can be osteonecrosis, so obviously is an important one, uh, but you can also have um, impingement and degeneration. And these can be, um, if it's impingement, it can be sometimes managed with an osteotomy. Um, but if there's advanced degeneration, then arthroplasty um, is, is the next step. All right, questions, concerns, comments? I have a question. Yeah. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about, we talk a lot about impedes is DDH, um, but we didn't talk about it here at all. And I'm just wondering if there's any literature suggesting or discussing the impact of DDH on Skippy. I, I would think that if anything, you know, it, 
could, it could impact the way that the, you know, the epiphysis moves in an escaphy type injury or maybe even a dislocation instead of a uh, skiffy. Um, I just yeah. curious your thoughts. I would, I would think of them as independent entities and there's no um, known correlation or relationship between the two. However, piggybacking off kind of you know using your thought process though one thing that is important to recognize is for example the valgus skiffy right the more rare presentation oftentimes those patients do have coxa valga to begin with uh, of course this may be unrelated to ddh this might be just coxa valga that they have um, and it goes back to that principle of you know um, biomechanical or mechanical forces on a susceptible physis right so um, uh, it is true that a valgus skiffy is probably more likely in a kid that has coxa valga but I would kind of, for, for when you're thinking about gener, gen, more generally hip disorders in kids, I would separate the DDH and Skippy. And, and there's nothing that we know of that, that um, has any correlation between the two. Yeah. Dr. Swerve, really quickly. Um, I know for um, when we're talking about unstable Skippies, obviously those kids are going to get admitted. They're going to get a fix pretty quickly. Um, but is there anything, I don't, I don't think we talked about this during the talk about timing of that. So obviously, you know, urgent as in do it the next day, but is it like, if let's say you have a kid who had the unstable Skiffy and for some reason wasn't diagnosed for a couple of days and then they come in and obviously your risk of osteonecrosis is higher with an unstable Skiffy, but do you talk with the parents be like, Hey, like he's, you know, he or she's been, yeah, um, unstable for like a few days now, those vessels are probably toast and now your risk of osteonecrosis is like out the roof or is there anything to, to say that at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is. Um, and so um, there have been some studies that have shown that fixing these um, urgently may be better um, and fixing them a little bit later may be better and fixing them in between might be um, more risky in terms of the risk of osteonecrosis. So um, generally, I think most people are fixing these within 24 hours. Um, and then, you know, that's kind of generally throughout the country. Um, and I have, I remember in fellowship, we had a case where we fixed it about seven days after. Um, and there has been this kind of like this honeymoon period that's been described where kind of like, you know, um, the risk is a little bit higher. Um, the risk of osteonecrosis is higher kind of in the day, I think I have to go back to the study, I think it was a study out of Asia that it's a little bit higher kind of in the two to three day range. And then the rate of osteoporosis decreases again. So in general though, the way to remember this for our purposes in North America is that I would just try to probably fix these um, uh, within 24 hours, so urgently. Um, and so like the next morning, for example, is, is a perfect, perfect way to think about it. Thank you. Yeah.